Next, we'll look at some simplistic, maybe crude methods, but again, very intuitive to people that are not finance people. And this one simply answers the question, how many years are going to be required for us to get back our money? That's a simple. If I, if I put in $100,000, how long will it take me to recoup that investment? And that's all it is, just getting back to, eat, to break even. It doesn't mean making money. It just means getting back our money. All right. Here we'll have our same projects, L and S, and we'll figure out what is the payback period. Then we'll compare them and see what makes sense. First thing we notice is that in time zero, we spend $100. I'll write here cumulative. And at the end of time zero, I'm negative $100. Right? Now, at the end of year one, I am now better off. I, I had $100 initially, but then now I've gotten $110. So I'm now at negative $90. All right, so I'm getting back my money. Next year, what happens? Well, I had negative 90, but I made 60. So I'm now at negative 30. How about the next year? Well, I started negative 30, and now I added 80. I'm positive. So this is what's really important to notice, is that during some time between years two and three, I went from negative to positive. And so the way to figure out what that is would be to say, okay, I made $80 in year three. I needed $30 to pay back, right? I needed 30 of the 80 to get me back to even. So therefore, I need 30 divided by 80 as a fraction. So the fraction is 0.37, five years. So I need a third of the year of year three when added back to years one and two will pay back for my hundred bucks. So the answer to this is payback period equals, and the answer would be two, 0.375 because these two were the first two and we add this little extra between years two and three. So let's do the same calculation here. So it starts off at the same. So again, this is cumulative. And at the year, end of year one, we are now negative 30. At the end of year two, we're positive. So oops, let's stop, right? So in between these two is our sweet spot. I needed 30, I need 30. And how much money did I make in year two? I made 50. So I need 0.6 of year two in order to do our payback. So payback period equals, and here it's 1.6, right? One year here, and this little extra here from year two to get 1.6. So this again is the superior result, and this is inferior because it takes longer, right? I'd rather get my back, money back sooner than later. So that's payback period. Now, does it make sense? So let's look at the numbers and say, I get my money back faster, but what you notice is that later on, I'm gonna start making more money. It is possible that if the projects go on beyond year three, it may be that project L is better because it's still exiting year three at a pretty high cash flow. Whereas it looks like Project S may be running out of steam here and it's going to drop off, right? We don't know that. It's just something we observe because but on a strict basis of payback, we get our money back fastest using payback from Project S. And that's what this is just illustration using graphics. So next is strengths and weaknesses. Strength is it's an indication and it's easy to understand, easy to communicate. And a lot of salespeople sell B2B products using this type of logic. Weaknesses is that it gets you to zero fastest, but it doesn't say what happens after that. So if something just goes on and on and on and keeps generating money, so you can hold it for 20 years and it generates money. And the second project gives you your money back in two years, but it dies after year three. Well, it may, it may be nice to get your money back faster, but it doesn't keep going for years and years and years, you forego the consideration of the upside. You're only trying to get your money back. So it's a very kind of risk averse way of viewing things. Next, and most importantly, it ignores time value of money. We all know that money today is worth more money than 10 years from now. And the whole payback period ignores the whole stream of cash flows and therefore is really kind of flawed in that it only looks at near term cash flows necessary to get you back your money. And we already talked about that. The other issue is there's no guideline for an acceptable payback. Now, earlier we had a hurdle rate that was a weighted average cost of capital, but here we have no such thing. So if we say, okay, it's 1.6 years, 
I don't know, is that good or bad? Or 2.4 years, I don't know, is that good or bad? There needs to be some judgment or management policy to accompany the computation of payback to make it usable at all. There is a way to address the critique that payback ignores time value of money because uh, I'll just do it through illustration here. Here are the cash flows, 100, 10, 60, and 80. Okay, so we know it's 2.375 years, right? So it's two years to get to negative 30 and 0.35 to make up that extra 30, so 2.375. Now, if we do the present value of each of those cash flows, and we now go negative this, then cumulative, cumulative, and bingo, it moves out to 2.7 years from 2.3 years. So it's a refinement. I don't really like this one, honestly, because it still ignores the future. And if you're going to go through the trouble of doing net present value, why don't you do, the, do it right through using an NPV formula or IRR? So I'm not even going to show you this on Excel. Next is normal versus non-normal cash flows. So what we're talking about here is normal would you pay money out early and then you get money back later, right? That's normal cash flow. And there's one change in signs, right? You lay money out, that's negative. And you get money in from that point on, positive. And all the things we've been doing on investments are essentially like that. But what if it's non-normal? In other words, there are two or more changes in signs. And so an example would be you have a negative outlay. Then you make a little money. Then you have another big negative outlay. Then you make a little bit more money. So it's bouncing around the cash flows. An example of this would be something that requires very expensive refurbishment or renewal during the life of a project. An example here would be an, a nuclear power plant, right? Clearly, after a certain amount of time, we have to do heavy maintenance and do things to make sure the rods and the containment is all done properly. So that could be a very major expenditure. The other one is a strip mine or an oil rig, let's say out in the North Sea. It costs a lot of money to drill the initial platform in the North Sea, but after a while, you have to refurbish it, and that's a major, major expenditure. Those are examples. When we have these kind of abnormal cash flow, we may have two or more internal rates of return because it depends on the different phases of cash flows in which we're operating. And MIR brings off positive cash flows back to a terminal value. So it's actually a, a way to address this. For a non-normal cash flow, NPV works. NPV almost always works. But we, if we want to use MIR, it would also work because it's normalizing all the inflows and outflows and grouping them into those categories and then computing the MIR that equates the PV to the FV. Two choices in non-normal, NPV and MIRR.